Let's go to uh, Acts 10, verse uh, 34 to 43. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And now let us join together for a short time of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the sacrifice that you made on the cross. We thank you for the freedom that you have given us. We thank you for the example that you have shown in loving and sacrificing and giving for others. We pray, God, now for all the nations to come to know you. We thank you for the boldness and the opportunity to be able to share our faith. We pray for unity among the global church as we testify to your goodness amidst this chaos, this crisis, and this suffering that we are seeing around the world. Most of all, God, we thank you for the forgiveness that you have offered to us and for the presence that we have now among you and your people. We thank you, God, for your joy, and we pray that it would fill our hearts this Easter weekend as we celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. It is good just to see your faces, to hear your voices, and it was especially wonderful not just to take the tour of the farm, but the chocolate-making demonstration was very near and dear to my heart. So it is a joy to have you worshiping with us and helping us to lead worship this morning. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Pastors sometimes repeat sermons, especially for Christmas Eve and Easter. Because if you think about it, if you've been in a church for a long time, and my last two appointments, one was 12 years and one was 11 years, I preached two different sermons each Christmas and Easter. So for each appointment, that was at least 24 different sermons on Christmas and Easter. And especially for Easter, if not for Christmas too, the story itself speaks volumes. I don't know many pastors who are not humbled by the story of Christ's birth and the story of his resurrection from the dead. You just want to read it and say, that's good enough. I'm just going to sit down now and let it stand. But this morning is not the morning that we had planned, as I said. We expected the church to be overflowing with folks. We expected to be here smelling the flowers and hugging one another and joyfully celebrating our Lord's resurrection. But that's not the case. And so I did not turn to one of my previous Easter sermons, I turn to one of my previous Christmas Eve sermons, not in its entirety, but in one point, and that would be the title of the sermon, Next Year in Jerusalem. That was the title of a Christmas Eve sermon that I preached December 24, 2001, just a few months, really weeks, after the attack on the World Trade Centers in New York City, the attack on the Pentagon, and the plane that went down in Pennsylvania. The country was reeling. People were afraid to celebrate. People were afraid, period, that it was going to happen again. And I don't know why I turned to next year in Jerusalem, which is the traditional end of the Seder meal that when Jews celebrate the Passover. At the end of that long meal where they 
remember the story of the Exodus and God's redemption. And Passover is still going on right now. We're in, the, I think, the third or fourth day of Passover, the fourth when you hear this, the third as we share today. And at the end of the meal, next year in Jerusalem, is always, always stated as hope in the coming Messiah, the still-awaited Messiah by our Jewish brothers and sisters. What made me think of that particular line was not the seders that I had attended, but one that I read about from Elie Wiesel, who is the noted laureate, the Nobel laureate, Jewish writer, who is also a Holocaust survivor and who died just a few short years ago. He remembered the Seder meal that was celebrated as he was a child in a concentration camp and how the adults who were there saved scraps of bread and dirty water to have the meal that they could not have. And he was moved to hear at the end of the meal when they together proclaimed next year in Jerusalem knowing full well that many of them would not live to see the coming year. That's a story that continues to inspire me. And it inspires me this year as we face this global pandemic, as fear sort of grasps us and holds us bound. Just like the women who went to the tomb were so afraid, and Jesus, as he said so many times, says to them, fear not, because even the idea of him being resurrected was something that was so startling and incredible that they were afraid of what it might mean for them. I thought of other examples too. I was blessed to visit Japan in 1991 as part of a group going from the Board of Global Ministries out of New York. And I went around and I visited Japanese sites that were founded by Christians. And I went to a university and in its museum was an edict board offering a reward for Christians because Japan was not open to the West again until 1853, after 200 years of closing its shores to the Western world. But before those shores were closed, Francis Xavier and other Portuguese monks had gone and established a Christian community there. And when the time came for the shores to open again, 200 years later, without a written translation into Japanese of scripture, there was a church present, even though the Japanese authorities had sought to eliminate Christianity. The edict board that I saw offered a reward for practicing Christians during that time period. If you were just a garden variety member of a church, the punishment was to be buried head first in a latrine until you suffocated. And if you were the leader of a church, your punishment was to follow the fate of your savior, to be nailed to a cross. And yet, 200 plus years later, there is an active and vibrant church in Japan when the shores are opened again in 1853. Stories like that humble me. Not so much in the past, but still in our time frame, in 1994, at Goshen United Methodist Church, one of our sister congregations. They had gathered for worship on Palm Sunday. The Reverend Kelly Clem was preaching when a tornado struck the building. Her husband, also a pastor, was at least safe because he was on a trip with the college students from the church because it happened during spring break for them. Nineteen members of the congregation were lost that day, including her own child. And yet, the following Sunday on Easter, they were there in the parking lot in the shadow of what used to be their church, praising God and celebrating the resurrection. She said on that day, on that Easter, it is God's story that we are living. And so, in spite of great obstacles, in spite of grief, in spite of fear and uncertainty, they gathered and they proclaimed the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. These are the stories that inspire me. I'm inspired too by the history of the love feast that we're going to celebrate. John Wesley was a little skeptical of the Moravians from whom he borrowed this practice until he met Peter Bowler. John Wesley had come to the United States one time before that was the United States during the colonial era. He had gone to Georgia 
things didn't work out well, and he sort of snuck out of town and got on a ship and was hiding to go back to England. There was a storm at sea, and he was cowering below decks, and what did he hear but hymns being sung in German, and being fluent in German, he knew what they were singing, and on the deck in the midst of the storm were the Moravians singing praise to God. Peter Bowler became a dear friend of John Wesley's, and he said to him one of the great questions of faith that I have returned to many times, what do you do when you don't have the faith you need to preach? And Peter Bowler said, that is when you preach faith. So we are here today to proclaim that our God sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, into the world so that we might, through him, live. He came as a human. He took upon his humanity our sinfulness. And though he was without sin, he, for our sake, went to the cross, went to the grave. And then on that Easter morning, when the women went expecting to anoint his body for a proper burial, they found the angel who rolled the stone away, not to let Jesus out. He rolled the stone away so they could see the empty tomb for themselves. And he told them to go and to tell his brothers, his disciples, that he was going to meet them. I love that this particular account of Easter, the Matthew account, because as a woman pastor, sometimes I've been told women should not preach. And I go to this story and I say, the Lord himself said, go and tell them, do not be afraid. Tell them I am alive and I will come to them again. For me, that is all the invitation I need to preach the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you on this Easter morning to Embrace the story as your own, to cast off fear. We do not know what is going to hit us next. We don't know who this virus will take from us, but we do know that ultimately we will be together again. When folks speak of a new normal, I try to convince them this is not normal. This is temporary. It may be a prolonged temporary state, but we will be together again in this building. So instead of next year in Jerusalem, what I say to you is next year in Cockeysville, if our Jewish friends can proclaim their faith in the Messiah sitting in a concentration camp when he in their understanding has yet to be revealed, how could we who claim Jesus Christ as our Savior, our Lord, God's Messiah, God's anointed one, God's only begotten son, how could we doubt that God will see us through this and everything we face. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. Next year here at Epworth. Next year at Epworth. Amen.